All right. I'm Stacy Higginbotham. I am a reporter with GigaOM. I think I might be a senior writer, but I always forget these things. These guys are the star here. We've heard a lot about OpenFlow, ripping out networks, all sorts of kind of hardcore, very tactical, a little bit of like the friendly, is it going to be open, is it going to be closed? All of this, we've done this all yesterday and earlier today. Now we're going to get kind of to the stuff that I get excited about because I love broadband. And this is all about how carriers and ISPs can kind of implement software-defined networks, do kind of cool things on the services side. And as a reporter and as a consumer, I look at this and I am like, the world is really going to change. Not just in a data center somewhere, which is really cool for some people, but like, I can set my Netflix stuff up to be prioritized over my daughter's you know, VoIP calls, especially if she's going to talk to a boyfriend or something like that. Uh, so that, that's exciting to me. And that's kind of some of the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to give each of the panelists 15 minutes. And they're going to step down. And then we're going to do Q&A at the end. I'm going to start it off. And then we're going to bring y'all like, y'all get a chance to go to the mic. So hold your questions. Please write them down if you're not going to remember them. And we're going to start it off with Axel. Thank you, Stacy. So good afternoon. How's everyone? Especially out there in the far sides of the room. So. Um, well, I think it's indeed a revolution we're in, in the networking industry. By the way, when I presented the same or a similar story in the UK a couple of weeks ago, I called it transformation. I thought here in the US, maybe I can call it a revolution. Uh, this is not referring to your relationship to Cuba. <laughs> so uh, within DT, I'm responsible for the IP architecture and um, I'm also representing DT in the ONF board. So uh, let me take you a little bit through the cruel world the carriers are in today. You heard Stu present yesterday with Verizon's view. Let, let me give you a little bit the view from DT. So we're definitely facing traffic growth over the next years. Whether it's a factor of 10, like conservative people tell, whether it's a factor of 50, like most of the industry analysts uh, predict for us, or whether it's even a factor of 100, we don't know. We just know that we need to serve our users facing this traffic growth, and we still need to be profitable. And being profitable is kind of a problem because we are living in a very competitive world. And my board member, she used the analogy, in the past, the ocean was blue, the sky was blue like it is outside. But now the ocean is red. It's filled with blood. Now, on one side, it's the traditional cable operators who we are competing against in some of our countries. On the other side, it's the over-the-tops taking all the interesting revenue away from us and kind of positioning us as the dumb pipe. Now, we don't want to be the dumb pipe because we, as a dumb pipe, we can't be profitable long term. Now, carriers are overall very good in exploring new technologies. And we're also especially strong in this uh, through our work with T-Labs. And you saw some of the work uh, we are doing in the open flow space out in the exhibition area in the Spark project, for example. But carriers sometimes have problems to bring innovation to market quick enough. And the reason is actually in the complexity of the existing networks. So I'm just using. The protocols here, the number of protocols we are carrying, we have a lot of legacy in our networks. It's very difficult for a carrier to switch off existing services. The question is, how can we meet the market needs moving forward? So roughly a year ago, work within DT was started to think about a new IP architecture which would position us for the future. And we called it TerraStream. So within the TerraStream architecture, we just have two types of routers. And for simplicity, we call them R1, that's the customer-facing edge router, and R2, that's a data center-facing and peering-facing edge router. So within TerraStream, we only have edge routers. They are connected using an open-ended optical ring, and over this optical ring, we provision IP circuits. Those are the green lines here. We simplified the network as much as we could. We questioned everything. We questioned all the protocols we are running today. 
So if you have only MPLS, uh, sorry, <laughs> if you have only edge routers, why do you need MPLS? Well, maybe for traffic engineering, but can we solve that otherwise if we just throw bandwidth at the problem? We decided to throw bandwidth at the problem, so between R1 and R2, we are over provisioned. Customers still need IP version 4, but do we need IP version 4 in the network? Mm, probably not. If you build something new, you should actually consider building such a network IPv6 only. And that's what we did in the terrestrial architecture. The other change we did was IP networks became very complex. The routers became very complex because part of the service production was moved to the routers, to service blades, and those beasts became very complex to configure. I sold them for 13 years working for Cisco before, so I know what I'm talking about. I happily sold them at that time. But for us, it becomes too expensive. So our vision is that we move the complexity into the network-centric data center. Those are the clouds we see on the top. Out of those clouds, we want to serve 40% of the traffic moving forward. And with that traffic growth and a customer base of something like 20, 24 million all across Germany, that's significant bandwidth delivered and served out of the data centers. Now, what's in those data centers? You see the purple boxes on the right here. By the way, when you work for telecom, you have to love magenta. So you sign that in your contract. Uh, so, but in the purple boxes on the right, these are the services we need to run the network and services we have today. So we need to deliver IP version 4. So the plan is to use DS Lite or a stateless variant of it. We need to deliver MPLS services. And the vision is to put the PE router for those customers who need MPLS into the data center and tunnel their traffic there. Sure, you need DHCP and DNS. And users should be able to self-service. So there's a self-service portal. You need the OSS. Video services, we're offering them today, so I put them as a purple box. But the data center also gives us the opportunity to bring new services to market. And those are the magenta colors I, I positioned here. Initially here, telecom services. We didn't quite give up on the over-the-top market yet, so we are also bringing our own cloud applications to market. So these could be delivered in the future and will be delivered in the future in these data centers. Carriers typically use large and complex IMS systems to deliver voice services on IP networks. And uh, maybe if RCSE-based multimedia applications and messaging applications become successful, then we definitely have IMS components to run in those data centers. Now, that small box below the IMS, the mobile services, is actually a very interesting one. When you look at fixed mobile integration, delivering services for both fixed and mobile customers. Well, in mobile world, it's slightly more complex than the fixed line world with the packet core. I envision that the mobile packet core of the future will actually be virtualized and be running in this data center as well. That might still take some time, but it will happen. And that was the thing you consistently saw at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago. Infrastructure as a service offers, yeah, sure, that's understood. CDN, yeah, should be running those data centers as well, especially if you think about 40% of the traffic. Much of it will be video actually controlled through a CDN. We also envision, and that's the yellow boxes on the left, that we sell infrastructure as a service to content providers. So we offer them a virtual machine and storage to deliver their services in a scalable way to our users in our network, directly integrated in the network. Now, the way we envision to run this network is actually using a real-time OSS. So the real-time OSS is controlling the full network. It has northbound interfaces to other providers using the network, like wholesale providers, for example, or like T-Systems, our business provider. But it should also have northbound interfaces to its applications. So applications can make use the most efficient use of the network. We even think that network engineers should never touch a router anymore. They still want to work with the CLI, but that CLI is actually a virtual CLI, and they work with the OSS. Now, if you think about it, 
that's actually an SDN. And it's, it's, it was quite amazing for me to see how, how much hype there was around SDN. And everyone called his story an SDN story. But hmm, is an SDN actually a well-defined term? Is it standardized? Um, I think it's not today. And uh, we have OpenFlow today. And uh, we just launched a paper on the uh, ONF website on the uh, OpenFlow-based SDN. So it's really worth reading if you haven't seen it yet. But uh, I think from the current OpenFlow, there's quite some work to do before we can call something a standardized SDN. And I see three areas. One is the southbound work. This is going on in ONF anyhow, and it's sure owned by ONF. Then we have the OpenFlow future work. We're at uh, close to 1.3 now, but the story has to continue. It needs to be implementable in hardware, so this work will continue. And it's part of ONF, obviously. Now, there was a question after Michael's presentation on who actually standardizes the northbound. Is it ONF? Is it maybe the ITF? Is it the ITUT who started some activities in there? And I very much agree with Michael, who answered that it might be a mix of standardization organizations. When you look at the northbound interface to its applications, there's some previous work in the ITF, for example. And it would not make sense to reinvent the wheel. So we need to work very closely together, but I definitely see uh, ONF in this role here as well. So. On that small little tile open flow today, where is it used in our network today? To be honest, nowhere. We're not using it in production. We're using it in R&D environments today. But uh, where could we use it, especially in this TerraStream context? And uh, one area is obvious, so I didn't even add a further slide on it, and that's the data center. And in the IBM presentation this morning, that was pretty much the story why it's worth to run OpenFlow in the data center. So there's another case, which is actually demoed out in the exhibition area uh, when you look for that spark sign. And that's the fixed access. We envision that we can optimize the fixed access using OpenFlow technologies moving forward. And that was successfully demonstrated in the EU Spark project. But there's another one where people normally don't talk about yet as a use case, and that's why I bring it up here, and that's the radio access network. Let's have a little bit of a look into how a radio access network looks like in a carrier environment today. So that's a typical example. You have a complex layer two infrastructure, and then at one point you aggregate towards a layer three infrastructure. It almost looks like a data center, except that the end nodes are not virtual machines, but E node Bs or node Bs. So, Within the radio access network, we have a couple of challenges. In some of our countries, we need to virtualize the RAN because we do network sharing. We want to monetize quality of service and value-added services. And this way, we need to enhance the RAN. And we have the traditional problems of a large Ethernet environment where actually someone can misconfigure a microwave link and build some nice shortcuts. So, I think this is an area where OpenFlow in the future can play a role. Now, I can't do it today because I need robustness. I need robustness and I need scalability, and I don't have that trust today. We need to look at it and evaluate it in R&D environments and then take it into operation as quickly as we can because I think it will help us on the business case, for example, for monetization of value-added services. But it's still a way to go. The next question I often receive is, well, you're in the ONF board, so hmm, why don't you run OpenFlow within TerraStream? Well, the problem is TerraStream is really a native IP network, part of the internet infrastructure. So it's not what was presented yesterday, a very well-defined uh, environment un fully under control where you can do these things. And unfortunately, we are not Google. So I don't have the resources to do these very innovative implementations today. So for me, the IGP and the BGP control plane won't disappear. Definitely not for the foreseeable future. So I envision that the future approach actually will be hybrid. 
And that's why I put uh, high bets on the hybrid uh, working group we started in ONF beginning of this year under a very aggressive time plan, but it's still a lot of work to do uh, in the hybrid working group. So maybe at the next ONS, I can give you an update whether we can d use this in our productive environment sooner. Today, for us, TerraStream is a cloud-enabled native IP architecture, and we do this as it gives us cost and service leadership and allows us to position ourselves as an innovation leader. That's the main reason why we're doing it, why we're bringing it to a customer trial within this calendar year, which is very, very much a stretch goal for a carrier to do this in incredibly short time frame. We see with TerraStream we are moving from a real-time OSS to a full software-defined network. And definitely as future steps, we will also look at how we can implement OpenFlow in parts of the network, whether it's the data center, whether it's the radio access network as discussed, or in the future maybe even uh, if hybrid is successful somewhere in the core. With that, I'd like to hand it over. I believe I saved a minute.